You are listening to continuing coverage of the trial of Chad Daybell from True Crime Today and the Hidden Killers podcast. Let's go back to the courtroom. Unmuted. Hey, hey, hey. All persons have any business before the Honorable Beverly Canoni, Justice of the Norfolk Superior Court in front of the county of Norfolk. If you are near, give your attendance and shall be heard. God save the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. This court is now open. You may be seated. Two one one seven, the Commonwealth versus Karen Reed. Can I have counsel identify themselves for the record? Adam Lally for the Commonwealth. Good morning, Your Honor. Good morning, Mr. Lally. Good morning, Your Honor. Laura McLaughlin for the Good Commonwealth. Good morning, Ms. McLaughlin. Good morning, Your Honor. Al Jackson for the street. Good morning, Mr. Jackson. Good morning, Your Honor. Elizabeth Little, also on behalf of the street. Good morning, Ms. Little. Good morning, Your Honor. David Yannetti for Karen Reed. Good morning, Mr. Yannetti. Good morning, Ms. Reed. Good morning, jurors. So I have to ask you those same three questions. Were you all able to follow my instructions and refrain from discussing this case with anyone since we left here on Wednesday? Yes. Yes. Everyone said yes or not affirmatively. Were you also able to follow the instructions and refrain from doing any independent research or investigation into this case? Yes. Everyone said yes or not affirmatively. Did anyone happen to see, hear, or read anything about this case since we left here Wednesday? No. Everyone said no or shook their hands. Thank you. All right, Mr. Lally, your next witness, please. Yes, Your Honor. May we approach just briefly? Okay. My apologies. Please, Mr. Lally. Yes, Your Honor. Call him, call him, Mr. Brian. The other sheet of the court during the case down here and should be truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you out. Yes, I do. Good morning, Your Honor. Good morning. Good morning. Anytime you're ready, Mr. Lally. Thank you, Your Honor. Uh, good morning, sir. Good morning. Could you please state your name and spell your last name for the jury? My name is Brian Higgins, H-I-G-G-I-N-S. And uh, where do you live, sir? Bonstable County, Massachusetts. And uh, how long have you lived there? I've owned that property since uh, approximately 2018. And uh, do you work, sir? I do. What do you do for work? I'm a special agent with the United States Department of Justice, Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, Firearms, and Explosives. And uh, how long have you been doing that? Just over 15 years. Now, sir, prior uh, to that, uh, prior to your appointment with the ATF, what if any other uh, positions, uh, what, what, if, what did you do for work before that? I was a lieutenant with the uh, Cambridge Fire Department. And how long uh, were you a lieutenant with the Cambridge Fire Department? I was a lieutenant probably for about eight years. Uh, total, I was with Cambridge approximately 15 years. Now, at some point, uh, did you reside in the town of Kent? I did. And uh, when was that, sort of what year to what year? I think that um, it was shortly after my sister passed away. So it was probably 2017 I purchased that house and I sold it in uh, January of 2022. And you recall, was that early January, late January? On or about January 5th. And when you sold that property, um, did you move down to Barnstable County or did you live uh, somewhere else as well? Um, for a period of time, I rented an in-law apartment in West Roxbury and I had my property uh, on Cape Cod as well. And that in-law property in uh, West Roxbury, that was in 2022 as well? Yes. Now, sir, if I could turn your attention to uh, January 28th, 2022 into January 29th of 2022. Do you recall those dates? Yes. Uh, do you recall what days of the week those were? 
I believe the 28th was uh, Friday and the 29th was Saturday. If I could take you back just to at least a day or so before that, um, on the specific of the 28th, on the 28th, where were you on that day initially? New York City. And uh, why were you in New York City, sir? I was for I, I was in New York City for the funeral services of Officer Mora and Rivera, who were killed in the line of duty. And uh, fair to say, there was a large contingent of, of law enforcement there. Yes. Uh, including several people from Massachusetts? Yes. And uh, when did you go down to New York City? I believe it was the 27th of February. Might have been Thursday. So was there a wake and a funeral? There was a wake and the funeral. Um, some people went to the wake, some people went to the funeral. There was services in, in, in over the, those couple of days. And you went to the funeral on the 28th, is that correct? <sighs> Yes. Um, and at some point, um, do you make your way uh, from New York City back towards Massachusetts on the 28th? Yes. And do you recall about what time of day that was? Late morning, possibly. And why is it that you were coming back on the 28th specifically? The anticipation of a, a, a blizzard. And uh, how did you, um, you drove, is that correct? I drove my government vehicle down to New York for the services. And uh, what kind of, of government vehicle was it that you drove down and back? That was a Dodge Ram pickup. Now, on the way back, uh, who, if anyone, came with you for the ride back from New York City to Massachusetts? Brian Elbit, Kevin Elbit, and um, Eddie Hernandez. And uh, who are they to you, and, and what, if any, relationship do they have to, to your work in law enforcement? Well, first and foremost, they're all friends. Um, Kevin Elbit is a detective with the Canton Police Department. Brian Elbit is a, was a sergeant detective with the Boston Police Department. Um, Eddie Hernandez, also a detective with the Boston Police Department. And how long had you known uh, each of these individuals? So out of the group, Eddie Hernandez would be the person that I knew the longest. I had worked with him back in the early 90s at uh, the Mass General. Um, then it would probably be Brian Elbit. Um, I may have had some contact with him when I was on the Cambridge Fire Department, assigned to the Fire Investigation Unit. Um, and then Kevin Elbit would be the probably the last in the three that uh, I knew. Now, <clears throat> speaking to uh, the Canton Police Department at that time, um, as far as your assignment went uh, with work, um, where was it that you worked out of or, or where was sort of your base of operation, so to say? Canton PD, I had an office there. And how was it that you, uh, that you came to have an office in Canton PD? Um, that relationship it was through Chief Berkowitz, um, born through a tragedy. When my sister passed away, uh, we became friends and uh, he offered up the space because I had, I had also moved there. So it was, it, was, it was close, it was a jumping off point. And uh, were, you the, were you the only federal agent that had space within the Canton Police Department? I was the only one that had an office. I, knew, I believe there was an HSI agent that might have had some access there uh, to come in, hook up his computer and stuff. And there was also an MBTA police detective, transit police detective, who also had access there, but I was really the only one that maintained a desk, so to speak. And as far as your work or, or familiarity with work as far as federal law enforcement officers, is that abnormal to have access to a local PD or, or have an officer or desk there? Objection. I'll allow it. No, um, it's not abnormal um, to have space within a department that you, 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 know, you work closely with. Now, as far as the, the ride back is concerned, um, when you um, drive from New York City back to Massachusetts, about how long a drive uh, was that? So typically it'd be a, I'd say like a four hour ride depending on uh, traffic. Um, this was longer and I would also factor in the, the, the fact that we stopped in eight on the way back. And when you arrive back to Massachusetts, where specifically in Massachusetts is it that you first go? 
so the, the first place that we went was um, a Boston Police Department district in um, Charlestown where Brian Albert and Eni Hernandez had parked their vehicles. How, as far as you know, did they, had they driven down to New York City or how would they come to be in New York City if you know? I, I believe that Brian Albert, Eddie Hernandez, and Kevin Albert all uh, flew down to New York. And uh, they drove back with you because of the storm, is that fair to say? Yes. <clears throat> now after um, dropping them off there, where did you go from there? I went back to the Canton Police Department where I dropped off um, Kevin Albert. Um, and then switched vehicles, got into my Jeep Wrangler, and I traveled up to the hillside in Canton. Now, as far as traveling up to the hillside in Canton, who, if anyone, uh, did you have plans with, or who, if anyone, did you coordinate with as far as going to the hillside? Brian Elbert agreed to, uh, to meet me there. And as far as uh, switching from your government vehicle to a personal vehicle, is that correct? Yes. And, and why did you do that before going to the hillside? because I was technically no, no longer on duty, so to speak, even though I had been at a funeral, but you know, I knew I would be consuming alcohol and we have a policy against that. Now, as far as uh, vehicles related to you, uh, whether they be personal or work and, and the Canton PD, how many vehicles did you have at that location? Uh, so I would have had my government truck that I parked there. Um, I would have had a surveillance vehicle that I parked there. And um, at times, it would sometimes f flip in and out between a pickup truck that I had and the Jeep itself. And uh, the Jeep uh, that you were driving that night, can you describe the Jeep, sort of what it looked like, what kind of Jeep it was? So it's a uh, 2011 Jeep Wrangler, gray in color. And at the time that I was driving it on the 28th and the, tw the 29th the next day, it had a plow on it. And the plow that you had affixed to the Jeep Wrangler, is that, um, how, how big a plow are we talking about? If I was to guess, it was probably six feet, eight inches. They may, I believe they make them in, in two uh, formats, six, eight, and I think seven, two. But I believe I have the smaller blade on that Jeep. And uh, how often would you have, was that like a year round thing? Or how often, uh, when, when about would you have that, that plow affixed to the Jeep? inclement weather or impending into inclement weather. And is that something that you uh, used as far as, it, what, what if any use did you put the, the uh, plow on the front of the Jeep to? To help family and friends clear the property at the Cape. Uh, I had used it when I had the house in Canton. And uh, so you go uh, to the hillside, and, um, do you know about what time it was that you got there? No, it, again, it would have been after I dro dropped off Kevin Albert. Um, definitely would have been dark at that time. And um, the hillside, is that an establishment that you're familiar with? You had been there before? Yes. And uh, about how long was it after you arrived that uh, Brian Albert arrived? He, sh shortly thereafter, probably. Because he, he was, he was, I had traveled back, um, dropped the vehicle off. He, he may have even beat me there because I, I went to the station and dropped Kevin off, but I don't think it was contemporaneous, but it was, it was in close proximity. And uh, once you got to the hillside, how long were you there and how long was uh, Mr. Albert there? So I had something to eat. I had something to drink. Um, the approximate time, um, maybe an hour or so, and then Brian had left before me. I remained, he left. And if you know about how long before you left was it that, that Brian Albert left? Can you repeat that again? Sure. Brian Albert left before you, correct? Yes. About how long before you left was it that Brian Albert left? Maybe 15 minutes. And uh, you had some drinks at the hillside, is that correct? I did. And do you recall what you drank that night? Usually what I drink all the time, Jameson and ginger. <coughs> and as far as where Mr. Albert was going, what if any conversation did you have about that? He had told me that he was going down to the Waterfall Bar and Grill, which is in Kent Center, and that um, he'd be meeting his, his, his wife and some family 
and maybe some other people. And were you invited to, uh, to come along? Yes. Now, the waterfall, that's an establishment you're familiar with. You've been there previous times as well? Yes. And <clears throat> with respect uh, to this evening, so you leave from the hillside and you, you go directly to the waterfall? Yes. And uh, if you know about what time was it that you got to the waterfall? Again, it was dark. It, it could it could have been around nine in in the area nine o'clock. And when you get to the waterfall, do you recall where in relation to the waterfall you you parked the jeep at that time? No. Um, so you come in to the waterfall, and and where do you go? Uh, I went to a series. I saw Brian and his family, and there was a series of um, high tops, and I proceeded to the high tops where where they were. Now. With respect to uh, to Brian Albert, um, how would you describe sort of your relationship around this time of January 2022? He's a good friend. Uh, he's a co-worker. I had been working closely with his um, his unit. Um, I'd say he was a good friend. And through that sort of work and your friendship, were you familiar with his, his family as well? Yes. And so when you came over to the area where uh, Brian Albert was, uh, his wife was there, correct? Yes. And who, if anyone else, uh, was there that you were familiar with or that you knew when you came? So it, it would have been um, Brian Albert. It would have been Nicole. I believe Caitlin was there. Uh, Brian, Caitlin Albert, Brian's daughter. Um, Chris Albert. His wife. Julie. Um, there might have been another couple, Matt McCabe and Jim McCabe. And as far as the McCabes were concerned, were you, how familiar were you with that? Casually. Now, at some point you come in, you join the group, is that correct? Yes. And how would you describe sort of, uh, throughout the entirety of the evening or your time at the waterfall, how would you describe sort of the, the mood or the demeanor of, of the group within the bar? It was a good time. Um, no arguments or anything like that that you observed from anybody that was present over the no, course of? No, it was a good time and there was a band. And uh, if you recall, about what time was it that you left? I would say right around when the band was wrapping up. So it was probably closer to midnight. Now, prior to that, at some point uh, between the time that you arrived and the time that the band's wrapping up and you're preparing to leave, who, if anyone else uh, that you were familiar with, uh, came into the waterfall? John O'Keefe and the defendant. And uh, just to be clear when you're referencing the defendant, what is what is her name? Karen Reed. And just to be clear for the record, uh, do you see Ms. Reed in the courtroom today? I do. Could you identify just as where she's seated or an article of clothing that she's wearing? She's, seating, she's seated between attorneys Jackson and Yanetti. No, I'm just asked the record to reflect identification of the defendant by the witness. Yes. Now, with regard to Mr. O'Keefe, starting there, as far as how, how long had you known Mr. O'Keefe? Maybe a year, a little over a year. And do you recall uh, how it was or, or where it was that, uh, that you first met, first met Mr. O'Keefe? I believe it was actually the hillside. And how often would it be that you, uh, that you saw Mr. O'Keefe or, or socialized with Mr. O'Keefe? I, I would see him at the, at the hillside. And um, as far as, were you familiar with what Mr. O'Keefe did for work? Yes. And what were you familiar with him doing for? He was a Boston police officer. And uh, with reference uh, to Ms. Reed, how long had you known the defendant? It would be about the same time, and or as long as. And so roughly, um, what, what was your understanding as far as the relationship between Mr. O'Keefe and, and Ms. Reed? They were dating. Now, with reference to um, occasions as far as, would there be occasions uh, typically where you would see Mr. O'Keefe without Ms. Reed or you would see Ms. Reed without Mr. O'Keefe or were they essentially together when you saw them? I would say more often than not they'd be together. And uh, did you have occasion to see them at other sort of uh, social settings outside of the hillside? I went over the house um, one time for the end of uh, Patriots game. Um, so if I could take you back um, let me ask you this, as far as, uh, through, how would you describe your relationship with John O'Keefe? I considered him a friend. 
And uh, how would you describe uh, your relationship with Ms. Reed? I considered her a friend as well. Um, now, through the course of, of time that you knew them, did you have occasion to um, get their contact information and have communication with each of them uh, through their phones? I had John's telephone. John and I uh, had exchanged telephone numbers. Um, and with reference to those communications, uh, were they texts, were they phone calls, or, or very? Oh, they would be text. And as far as the text communications that you had, you received this contact information, you texted, someone replied. How did you know that that was John O'Keefe that was replying to you? Well, I had him saved in my phone, John O'Keefe. I don't, I don't know exactly where he gave me his phone number, but I, I knew it was him. Now, on that evening, uh, taking you back to the waterfall, uh, January 28th into January 29th, uh, do you know about what time it was that Mr. O'Keefe and the defendant came into the waterfall? It would have been, I think, between like 11 and closing. And uh, do you recall sort of where you were situated in, in reference to the table when they came in? So I, I, I think I was at the high top bar area, clo the, the high top in the bar area closest to the bar. <laughs> And uh, when Mr. O'Keefe and Ms. Reed came into uh, the waterfall, uh, what, if anything, did you observe? Uh, where did they go when, when they first came in? So when they fir first came in, um, I believe they may have initially went and like, veered off in different directions. Um, I recall that she opened a coat and took a drink out of it. A I should say a glass. And what, if any, observations did you make of the glass that uh, Ms. Reed took out of her coat? Uh, it, was a tall, it was a tall glass. Um, it looked like a clay liquid in there. And uh, at some point, did you uh, come to find out where uh, Mr. O'Keefe and Ms. Reed had been prior to coming to the waterfall? Objection. Sustained. Are you familiar with another establishment in Canton called C.F. McCartney? Yes. Is that a place that you've been to before? Yes. Now, as far as the glass uh, that you saw uh, with reference to the waterfall and or C.F. McCarthy's, what, if any, observations did you make of it? Well, that it wasn't from the waterfall. And, and what makes you say that? Well, she walked in with it and took it out of her coat, um, but it wasn't consistent with the type of glasses that the, the waterfall had. And so let me just ask one further question in regard to that. So when you say it wasn't consistent, what was it about it that made it inconsistent with uh, glasses from the waterfall? I believe it was a, a, tall, a tall glass and kind of um, like bubbles on the side of it, so to speak, like the, the design. Now, after you make those observations, uh, at some point over the course of the time that you were at the waterfall and they were there as well, did you have occasion to uh, have a conversation with Mr. O'Keefe? I did. I don't know that if it was initially when he first came in, um, but I, I, I did have a brief conversation with him as to the content. I don't recall what that was. Just small talk, fair to say? Greetings. And with regard to Ms. Reed, during your time at the waterfall, what, if any, conversation did you have with her? I did not have any. Now, at this point in time on uh, this date, did you have uh, Ms. Reed's uh, cell phone information? I did not. Um, at the time that you were at the waterfall? No. You recall sending a text or... Oh, um, I'm sorry. Can you repeat that question again? Um, at this time, I, I know we've jumped around a couple of days, but at this time that you're at the waterfall on the 28th or the 29th, did you have Ms. Reed's contact? Yes, I did. Okay. And at some point uh, over the course of the evening while you were at the waterfall, did you send a text to Ms. Reed? I did. And do you recall what the substance of that text was? I think it was something like, um, well. And do you recall uh, <laughs> meant as far as that text message or why you had sent that to her? Uh, to be honest with you, it was, I, I, I guess you could view it as a flirty text. Now, <clears throat> around midnight or so when you leave the waterfall, uh, well, I'm sorry, let me take it back just one step. Um, at some point over the course of the evening while you're at the waterfall, what if any discussion is, is there around the table as far as next steps or where to go from there? Well, there was talk at the table, I, I think initially about going back to Chris Albert's pizza shop 
to have some food and drink. And at some point that transitioned into going back to Brian Albert's house. And uh, as far as the invitation to go back to Brian Albert's house, uh, was that something that was extended to the entirety of the table? It, it's, I, I took it as an open invitation to the people that were together at the table, yes. And uh, Mr. Albert's house, is that somewhere that you had been to before? I had been there, uh, the twins' graduation party, which was outside in the backyard. And I think I may have dropped him off on one occasion. I may have dropped something in his mailbox, but those would be the only other times. Um, and are you familiar, at least now, with, with the address and sort of where you were going? Did you know where you were going that night? I knew where I was going, yes. Oh. And the address was uh, 34 Fairview Road, is that, that correct? That is correct, yes. And um, about what time, uh, about midnight or so when you're, when you're leaving, um, who, if anyone, was leaving uh, the bar around the same time? I mean, I think pretty much everybody was wrapping up and leaving. Uh, I know that I, I beat Brian and Nicole back to the house. Now, as far as the time at the waterfall um, with reference to either Mr. O'Keefe or Ms. Reed, uh, what, if any, observations did you make in regard to what they were drinking that night? I think John was having beers, his, his typical, what I would see him with, and um, the defendant had, you know, glasses. And you recall her ever at any point that you were there, if you recall, uh, drinking out of a glass different than the one she took out of her coat when she first arrived? I don't recall. Um, now, you drove from the waterfall to Fairview Road. About how long a drive was that? Probably a few minutes. But the weather was, you know, this, I remember when I came out, I put the wipers on. There was some snow on the ground. But it was the type of snow where the roadway was still black at the time, but because it was being driven on, but the sidewalk had a light coating. And you drive over to the home and uh, you mentioned that you beat uh, Mr. Albert there, is that correct? I did. And so with regard to the home when you get there, what, what, what did you do when you got there? Well, I was kind of being a smart ass and I dropped the plow and I did a little sweep of the driveway and then I got out of the driveway because I didn't want to get uh, blocked in and I parked. And uh, do you recall where you parked in relation to the house? I do, by the mailbox. Uh, Your Honor, with the court's permission, if I could uh, publish what's been marked as Exhibit 72. Okay. And uh, Mr. Higgins, do you recognize what's printed up on the screen there? I do. And uh, what do you recognize that? 34 Fairview. Sorry, may I approach on? Yes. So, Mr. Higgins, with that laser pointer now in your hand, if you could uh, direct the jury's attention to, <coughs> if you see it in the photograph, uh, where you parked uh, your Jeep at. So the, the back end of the Jeep would have been right around the mailbox itself. And the edge of the driveway is right there. I, I wanted to make sure that I was not blocking the driveway or blocked in. And uh, so the front of your vehicle would have been pointed in which direction? I believe that'd be going towards Chapman Street. And so which part of your vehicle was the closest to um, the house, the driver's side or the passenger side? So the passenger side would be um, closest to the house. So you're parked along the front of the house sort of with track, correct? Yes. Okay. Come on, you can take that down. Thank you. Uh, so you arrive at the house, uh, you do, um, as far as the, the maneuver with the, with the plow in the driveway, and then you park the vehicle, and where is it that you go from there? Uh, into the house. And when you get into the house, uh, who, if anyone, is, is there, or who, if anyone, is, is coming in with you? So I might have been there, well, it was about the same time that Brian and Nicole showed up. I don't know if they entered before me or I entered after them. I entered the house. The, what I recollect is 
that Brian Alva Jr. is sitting uh, kind of at the island or in the island area. And I believe he was flanked by at least w one female, possibly two, one on each side. And either of those uh, females, did you, did you know them? Did you recognize them? Did you know who they were? I may have recognized one I've seen before, but I didn't know them. And just lastly, before we go back into the house, when you park, um, when you do the, the sort of plowing in the driveway and then parking, um, did you see Mr. Albert arrive at the house around that time? What, when I parked the, the Jeep? Yeah. Well, yes, I, so I made the sweep, and as I could see the vehicle coming up, I made the sweep, got out of the way so he could park. Okay. Uh, so we had parked in the driveway around the time that you're parking on the street? Yes. Okay. Um, and so when you come to the house and, and you see the people that you've described, where were they situated within the house? So I came through what I would call like a breezeway door. So there's a, there's a front door to the residence, there's the garages, and in between there is a, um, like a breezeway door. I came in through there, and it's kind of like you're in the kitchen. And I think there's like an island, so to speak. You may be able to sit at it, and they were, they, he would, Brian Edward Jr. was right there, and again, flanked by one, if not two, females. Now, at some point uh, after your arrival, who, if anyone else uh, that you were familiar with, came by the house? I believe it was Jen and Matt McCabe. You know about how long it was after you arrived that they arrived? No, I don't know. A prog I mean, I don't think it was much longer. People started, you know, flowed in at that point. And uh, beyond uh, sort of the, the kitchen area that you were describing before, where else did you go within the house that night? At one point, briefly, Brian Albert showed me some photographs, family. I believe primarily it might have been of his son who had recently been in the Marine Corps. Gone into, I should say. And uh, do you recall or, or why was he showing you specifically like those photographs of, of his son in the Marine Corps? Because he's proud. Now, as for, uh, let me ask you this. As far as yourself and or Mr. Albert, what if any familiarity or what if any background do you, do you or Mr. Albert have with regard to the military? Brian was in the Marine Corps, I was in the Army. Um, now this period um, that you're talking about in, in the other room, um, about how long a period was that? It was, it was brief. And beyond yourself and Mr. Albert, was there anyone else uh, from the group that you described that was in the room at the same time as, as you and Mr. Albert? I don't think so. I think Nicole may have popped in for a second, but I'm, I'm not 100% positive on that. And as far as, do you know approximately what time you left uh, the house on, on Fairview that evening? I'd guesstimate it was anywhere between 12.30 and 1 o'clock, but I'm not 100% positive. So relatively short period of time, is that correct? It, it was a short period of time. Um, I knew kind of from the onset when I got in there, it probably wasn't going to be a long time because uh, I'm not a beer drinker and that's what they had. So I was probably one of the first people to leave. Now, <clears throat> for that entirety of the time that you were there, did you go anywhere else within the home beyond what you've described as far as the kitchen and the living room? No. Did you go upstairs at any time? No. Did you go downstairs in any sort of basement area at any time? No. And when you exited the home, do uh, you recall which of the two doors that you described that you would have exited from? The same door I came in, the breezeway. Now, during the time that you were there, um, similar to what I asked about the waterfall, how would you describe sort of the mood or, or demeanor within the home? It was, it was fine. I mean, everybody was happy. And um, at any point in time, uh, while you were at 34 Fairview, do you, uh, any of the people that were in the house, do you recall seeing them go outside of the house and come back or anything like that? Not, I can't say definitively I saw anybody come in or out of the house, but I think somebody might have been in the process of, of maybe being picked up. And not anybody that you were super familiar with, is that fair to say? I think it was one of the females. Now, with respect um, to the front of the house, at any point in time that you were inside of the house, uh, was your attention drawn or did you look out the windows or the door or anything like that? No. 
And when you were in the kitchen area, do you recall uh, sort of how you were positioned in relation to uh, the windows facing the front of the house? So I would have had my back to that area, back, back, my back to the, the door that I came in. And specifically with reference to uh, Mr. O'Keefe and Ms. Reed, at any point in time, did you see either of them uh, inside the house or outside of the house or around the house or anywhere around 34 Fairview Road? Absolutely not, no. And um, at any point in time, um, over the course of the evening, what if any communication or, or text or anything did you send to either of those two people while you were at the house on Fairview? While I was at the house, I, I, I think I shot a text just to John. Where are you? I think that's what it was. And uh, if you recall, did you ever get a response to that text? No, there was no response. Um, so after you left uh, the waterfall, uh, when you left the waterfall, was Mr. O'Keefe and Ms. Uh, Reed, the defendant, still there? I can't say 100 percent, no. Um, but after you left the waterfall, uh, at any point in time, did you uh, speak to, text with, or communicate in any way, shape, or form, or see in any way, shape, or form, either Mr. O'Keefe or Ms. Reed? Well, again, the only person I, I shot the text to while I was at the house was John, but after I left the waterfall, I, I never saw John O'Keefe or the defendant again. Now, when you left from the residence, uh, and again, you're not sure what time that was? Between 12.30 and one o'clock. And do you recall who amongst the group was still at the house at the time you left? I think I was probably the first person to leave. Uh, so all of the other people that you've described would have still been in the house when you exited from the house? Yes. Um, now, you indicated earlier that you're familiar with uh, Mr. Albert and his family to some extent, correct? Yes. You've been to his house for a graduation party for his twins, correct? <sighs> yes. Through that, at any point in time, uh, prior to this date, did you become aware or familiar with uh, Brian Albert's nephew, Colin Albert? I know the name and I know that he is one of the sons of uh, Chris Albert. Are uh, you familiar with what he looks like? If he walked in here right now, I wouldn't know. You would not know? No. Oh. Um, and beyond the people that you've described as far as seeing at 34 Fairview Road, fair to say you don't recall anybody being introduced or identified as Colin Albert? No. Now, you exit uh, from the home through the breezeway door and go over to your vehicle, is that right? Yes. And from the time that you would enter the home to the time now that you're exiting from the home, what, if any, change did you note as far as the weather intermittently? Just that the, the, the weather was getting worse, the snow was picking up. And as far as the accumulation that you had described before, uh, as far as you could still see the blacktop and all that when you left the waterfall, what was it like when you came out of the house? Again, I, I, I think that the streets that weren't being traveled, there was, there was snow on them. There was coverage. And as far as the front lawn area of the house at 34 Fairview Road, what, if any, observations did you make of that? Can you rephrase that? Sure. As far as the snow was concerned, was yes. the snow sticking to or was it accumulating on the lawn as well? I, I believe so. I mean, I walked through, I mean, when I walked from the breezeway to, to the Jeep, there was snow on the ground. <clears throat> now, the front yard area of the house, is that something that you were looking at with any particularity or, or, or taking note of as you were walking in your Jeep down the driveway? No, it was a long day. Uh, we had been on the road. I just was looking to get home. And uh, so when you get uh, to your Jeep, uh, can you describe to the jury sort of how it was that you pulled away or what, if anything, you recall about that process? So I got in the Jeep, you know, started it up, may have looked at my phone, uh, put it in drive and started to pull away. And then I'm like, put the plow up. So I reach, you know, it was, I, I moved a couple of feet. I heard it, I heard it grinding on the ground, reached for the device called a fish stick, picked it up lifted the plow, and then drove away. And the plow that you had affixed to the front of the Jeep, um, how is, I, I think you've talked a little bit about it, but how is that sort of controlled and, and who controls that? So the operator controls it. The mechanism to control it, again, is called a fish stick. It's, it's on a cord and it plugs in under the dashboard. 
And I, I, you know, I reached down to find out, I don't know if it was on the floor or between the seats, but it's not like a joystick that's attached actually to the dashboard. So some sort of hydraulic system, is that correct? I, yes, it's a hydraulic based. Now, in addition to moving it sort of up and down, um, is there any other way that you can manipulate the, the blade as far as that switch is concerned? Yes. Yeah, so if uh, I would generally, if I'm driving around town and, and I'm not worried about the vehicle heat, heating up, I just lift the, the plow off a couple feet off the ground. Um, if I was on the highway, I would tilt it to get airflow. And as far as height is concerned for that plow, if you were to lift it all the way to the top, what, if any, impact would that have with reference to uh, your line of sight or visibility through the windshield? Zero. So even if it's raised all the way as far as it can go, you can still see over the top of the blade? Yeah, I, I, it, it, if, it come, if it comes even with the hood of the Jeep, I, I'd be surprised. Um, so you pull forward a couple of feet and then you lift it about how high did you lift it when you're pulling, when you stop and then lift up? Probably like a foot or two. And as far as um, following that, you pull away from the house, is that right? Correct. And as you're pulling away from the house, uh, where is your attention drawn or, or what, if anything, did you see as far as when you're pulling away from the house? Wasn't drawn to anything. I just drove away. And uh, when you drove away, um, again, during that process, did you see anything outside of the house that, that drew concern or your attention or anything like that? No. Now, as far as when you get out to your vehicle and you're driving away, um, were there any other vehicles on the street that you saw in the area of, of the residence at 34 Ferry? I didn't see any. And do you recall whether or not there were any uh, tire tracks in the snow or anything that you saw when you came out to the vehicle, if you recall? I do not recall. Now, you leave the residence at 34 Fairview, and, and where did you go from there? I went back to the Canton Police. And why was it that you went back to the Canton Police Station? Well, we had traveled down for the, for the services for those police officers, and we anticipated staying the following day. We had, I think I had said that we left the day earlier. So I had left um, a key to the surveillance vehicle on top of my desk, so that somebody could move the vehicle because some of the, a lot of times Chief Berkowitz would get after me uh, as a courtesy, I was parking vehicles there, sometimes my personal, but primarily my work, my work vehicles. And um, one thing he asked me, just leave the vehicles in the middle of the parking lot that, so that snow could be cleared. So the reason for heading back there was to move those vehicles because if I didn't do it then, I would have had to get up early and do it. And I also know they plow through the night, so that would be the reason for heading back. Before we get a little more into that, as far as the funeral that you went to, were these people that you knew or had met or were familiar with? No. Um, so you get back to the police station, and um, with regard to the Can Police Station, um, what, if any, access did you have to the Can PD, and, and sort of how did you, how did you facilitate that? So I would describe it as a proxy card. The doors have card readers. Generally in the parking lot, when you, when you come into the police station, you drive in, sally ports are off to your right-hand side. There's, there's two uh, bay doors there. There's a pass-through door. And then over in the corner would typically where I would, I would bury both vehicles. So if I was, typically it would be my, my, my take-home pickup truck that I described earlier and it would be the surveillance vehicle. But if I had, I, that could be swapped out with one of my personal vehicles. I would leave a personal vehicle there if I took one of those two vehicles. And then for me to access into the building, the most direct door would be that pass-through door by the Sally Port. And so to that back area, is that typically where you would park? Yes. And just in reference to the, you talk about a surveillance vehicle, that's something that you use as far as conducting surveillance and performance of your duties as a law enforcement officer? Yes. And so fair to say that would not be something you would want to park, like say, in front of the police station? No. Um, now, that path that you took, uh, is that the typical path that you would take, sort of park to the back and then cut through the sally port into the station? Yes, that's, I mean, that would be, that would be the, the route that I would go. And if you recall, is that the route that you went on uh, that particular early morning when you came back to the station? I believe it is. 
And when you come back um, to the station uh, and you go in, you're going, where are you going within the police station when you went? So, when you, well, I'm going up to the, I was going up to my office to, to, to grab the key for that surveillance vehicle. So when you come through that pass-through door at the Sally Port, the first door would be the, through um, the booking and the holding area that directly goes into the dispatch area. But if you walk to the extreme other end, uh, there's, a, there's another door on the other end, common hallway. Uh, I'd walk down that hallway, hit a set of stairs, and I would, I would go up that way. Now, if I could take you back just for a second, as far as when you initially walk into the, the Sally Port area, that's a, a garage, basically, correct? Yes. Okay. And when you come into uh, the garage, um, the door that you would then enter to come into the station, where is that in relation to the door that you come from the exterior? How far away are the two? So if you come in, I guess what you're asking, so if I come into the Sally Port immediately to the right, there's the door that goes into the holding area, booking area, and then probably five, I mean, it's probably 12 feet long to get to the other door. So from where you're parking and where you come into the Sally Port, it's not like you then have to walk across the garage or anything like that to get to the door into the station, is that correct? Well, you do walk across the garage, but it's small. Uh, and when you say small, about how, how far, you know? About 12 feet, maybe. Um, and so you come into the station, uh, you go by the dispatch, is that correct? So as I'm walking down the hallway, dispatch would be off to the right. It's uh, a wooden door with two glass panes. And as far as uh, the Cannon Police Station is concerned, are you familiar with or were you aware at the time that there is uh, sort of security and cameras and such uh, around the station? Yes. Um, you're aware that those cameras record, is that correct? Yes. And uh, are you aware of any records that are generated as far as your key card access when you go through a certain door at a certain time? Well, I've never seen those records, but I, it's my understanding they they it tracks act, access access control. And uh, did you happen to go by uh, the dispatch area specifically? And if so, do you know who was working there that night? Newly promoted Sergeant Good, I believe. Probably, probably he was on midnights. Do you have any specific recollection of seeing him there that evening when, or that early morning when he came by? I believe I waved to him. And as far as when you get to the police station, do you have any, how far drive is it from Fairview to, to the police station, if you know? Well, I mean, the, the weather was picking up, so it probably took me a little bit longer to get back, but it's probably five, ten minutes, maybe. Now... The key that you went to your office to get a key, correct? Yes. And why had you left the key to one of the vehicles in the office? So as I stated earlier, I anticipated not even being back in Massachusetts, knew the storm was coming, didn't know how bad it was, but I left the key on the desk to facilitate somebody being able to move that. And so you go to your office, you get the key, and then where did you go from there? I go back downstairs and I move the vehicles to the center of the parking lot. And then um, at some point you leave, is that correct? Yes. Do you know about how long it was uh, after you moved the vehicles around that, that you left Camp PD? Not long, but I'd be guessing if I gave you a time. And so where did you go from there? I went back to West Roxbury. And which vehicle uh, that you've described, which of those vehicles did you use to get from Camp PD to West Roxbury? The Jeep Cherokee, uh, Jeep Wrangler, sorry. Um, and if you know about what time was it that you, that you got home to West Roxbury? Could have been somewhere around 20 or two. Uh, I'm, I'm not a hundred percent positive. So sometime between one thirty and 2 AM, is that roughly around? Yes. Okay. Um, and when you, uh, get home, uh, about, do you recall like what it was that you did when you got home? Well, it'd be, it was again, it was a long day. We, we, we had traveled, the traffic, it just seemed like it dragged on forever. But I think I did what I typically do after being out, having a couple of drinks. I had something else to eat, and I believe I might have had another couple of drinks and either laid on the couch and, or, or laid on my bed um, and Typically, I would fall asleep if I was on the couch and wake up and go into the bedroom. I don't know which, where, what location I was in at that point. 
Now, after you fall asleep at some point later on uh, that morning or uh, something, you wake up, obviously, at some period, correct? Yes. And do you recall what it was that, that awoke you on that morning? I mean, for lack of better words, my phone, both my work and my personal phones were blowing up. They were going off. And uh, if you know about what time in the morning was that, that occurred? Probably around 6.30ish. And uh, who, if anyone, you know, as far as you, you look at your phones and who, if anyone, was blowing up the phone or who, who was calling you with that? Well, I think first it was Chief Berkowitz and then uh, Brian Albert. And you mentioned first it was Chief Berkowitz. Did you, did you answer the Chief's call at that time? No. And was that abnormal for the Chief to be calling you at, at that time of day? No, he, I mean, he's an early riser, and typically when he was working, you know, again, we, we also had a friendship. You know, he, he, would, he would call in the morning, kind of like checking in with each other. Um, so I just kind of blew like, why are you calling me this early? Kind of just blew it off. But then when I saw Brian Elbert calling me, like that kind of caused me some concern because I'm like, why is he calling me? He's been out, he was out with me all day yesterday. Um, we, we both had the same long day, and I, I was concerned at that point. And so you answer the phone from Mr. Albert, is that correct? Yes. And uh, what, if anything, did you learn from him, or, or what, if anything, did he tell you? Objection. I'm going to sustain the objection at this point. Um, so you receive a call from him, and you have some sort of conversation, correct? Yes. Now, prior to that, from the time that you got home to the time that you answered this call from Brian Albert, um, do you recall uh, having any phone calls or conversations with anybody uh, during that time period? No. And specifically, did you talk to Brian Albert on the phone at any point between the time you left his home and the time that you woke up the next morning to his phone call? No, I did not. Now, the previous day, over the course of it, um, you know, we're all waking up in New York and then driving home and going to the hillside and going to the waterfall and going to Mr. Albert's house. Had you and Mr. Albert communicated via cell phone, whether it be text or, or phone call at any point in time during the course of that day? You mean the day before? Yes. Yes. Um, so he was fairly recent in your contacts, is that correct? Yes. And so as far as uh, that phone call uh, that you received from Mr. Albert, uh, based on whatever information that you uh, learned from that, um, what did you do then? Uh, I, I, I got dressed and went right over to the house at 34 Fairview. And uh, when you left your house in West Roxbury and went back to 34 Fairview, what were you driving at that point? I was still in the Jeep Wrangler. Uh, and if you know about what time or so was it that you arrived at back at 34 Fairview late that morning? Maybe a little after seven. And uh, when you arrived there, um, what, if anything, did you see? I mean, I just went into the house. As far as outside of the house, when you arrived there, what, if anything, did you see outside the house? I don't recall. Maybe a police car. I, I don't remember. <clears throat> now, with regard to... Uh, Starting with the weather, when you woke up and you were driving back to 34 Fairview, what was the weather like at that point in reference to when you had gotten home to West Roxbury the night before? It was real bad. Um, and as far as when you get to the house at 34 Fairview sometime around 7 a.m. or so, where is it that you parked in relation to the home at that point? I might have went in the driveway. I don't, I don't remember specifically where I parked. And as far as other vehicles there, how many other vehicles, were, were there more or less vehicles there that morning than there were when you were there the night before? I couldn't, I couldn't say definitively. And when you come into the house, uh, who, if anyone, is it that you see inside the house when you get there? So I saw Brian, I saw Nicole. Brian Jr. may have popped in and out of the, the kitchen, same kitchen area that I was in before. Uh, Jen and Matt McCabe, and then a short time later, uh, Julie Albert showed up. And uh, Julie Albert, when she showed up, what, if anything, did you observe her to have with her when she showed up? Like a box of donuts or muffins or something like that. And uh, as far as the 
house when you come in, um, sort of the evening before, but how would you describe sort of the mood and, and demeanor of the people in the house when you arrived there later on that morning sometime around seven or so? The people were pretty distraught. Um, and did you know why they were distraught? Because John had been found on the lawn. And is that why you had gone to the house? Yes. And when you received that information or were informed of that, um, how did you receive that information or, or, or what, if any, impact did that have on you? Well, objection, Your Honor. Sustain, you can ask it differently. <clears throat> when did you first learn of Mr. O'Keefe being found on the lawn at 34 Fairview? During the phone call at, at about 6.30ish when uh, Brian Albert, when I spoke with him. And what was your reaction when you received that information? It didn't make sense to me. Um, I, I couldn't do the math in my head because I know John O'Keefe and, and the defendant never, they never showed up. It didn't make sense. And so from this time uh, that you're, you're in the house, um, do you recall any sort of conversation about uh, within the group as far as what was going on? Objection. Just do you recall that there was a conversation? Yes, I, I recall that there was conversation and it is... Objection. Just, just that. Okay. Next question, Mr. Lally. Now, from the time that you arrived there uh, later on that morning, about how long a period of time were you there for? Less than an hour. And from there, where did you go from there? I don't know if I went back to the police station or I went to West Roxbury. Might have been the police station. And if you went to the police station, why would you have gone to the police station at that point? Because I was still trying to put things together in my head. I was, I was upset. Um, those would be the reasons. Do you recall whether or not, bless you, do you recall whether or not you were at the police station that day? Yes. I, I'll, I'll allow it. Yes, I, I, I'm pretty sure I was there. And uh, do you know about how long you were there or about what time it was that you were there? No, I couldn't say specifically. And after you left the police station that day, where did you go from there? At some point, I probably went back to West Roxbury. Um, I, would, I, I don't specifically remember. Now, um, again, from when you went, uh, maybe a fairly simple question, but as far as you drove the Jeep Wrangler from West Roxbury back to Fairview Road that morning, correct? Yes. And then you drove that Jeep Wrangler from Fairview Road to the Ken Police Station at some point during the day? I, I believe I was in that vehicle all day. Now. At some point, a few days uh, following this, uh, did you uh, have occasion to meet with some troopers from the state police? I did. And do you recall who those troopers were? Trooper Proctor and Trooper Buchanan. And uh, were you familiar with those uh, troopers prior to that date that you met with them? So I was um, familiar with Trooper Buchanan. Um, evidently, I was... Uh, I was reminded by Trooper Proctor that I had met him before. I think I helped him on a, uh, a, gun, a, a gun recovery that he made, but I, I didn't remember him. And as far as you mentioned, you know, sort of socializing with other officers from law enforcement, had you ever socialized with either uh, Sergeant Mechanic or Trooper Proctor before? So Trooper Pro Proctor, no. Um, I had seen, um, Trooper Buchanan on a number of occasions um, at the, a local gym. Um, I had seen him one side at, a, at, I had seen him one time at the hillside. 
I think he might have been with the, his child after a sporting event. I think I bought, I said hello, I bought him a drink. Um, but I wouldn't classify that as socializing, more being friendly. But I also, the, that area of responsibility, the South Shore, South of Boston, Cape and Islands, that's, I was assigned to a group where I would interface with people in that area, and that Norfolk um, CPAC office would be people that over the years I've probably dealt with. Now, when you met with him on this day, do you recall specifically what day it was? No. Um, if I said February 3rd, would that sound about right, or, or if you know? It, it, I would say in that area. And when you met with them, you had a, a conversation with them or an interview in, in regard to what had transpired on the 28th and 29th, correct? Yes. And um, following sort of the substance of that interview, uh, what, if anything, did you provide the troopers with? I provided them with um, text messages that I had exchanged and had on my phone with um, John O'Keefe and text messages that I had exchanged with the defendant. And how did you, uh, in, in what sort of format did you provide those text messages uh, to the troopers? Well, they were, they, they were copies. Um, and I believe that the, the format would be uh, the way to categorize it, screenshots. And how is it that you sort of generated these from, from your phone? Um, I consulted a coworker, who's also a friend, and um, he, was a, he, has, he has the training with the cell phones. Um, I told him I wanted to provide these to the state police. You know, what is the best way that I can get them off, the, off my phone and provide them to law enforcement? And why was it that you uh, felt it was important, or why is it that you wanted to, to share those with the troopers? Well, I thought it was important because I've had communication with the both of them, and um, I wanted to be fully transparent. <laughs> now, with reference to either or both of those communications uh, with Mr. O'Keefe and Ms. Reed, um, the material that you provided to the troopers, what if, what did, if anything, did you do to that material before giving it to them? Nothing. So as far as the material or the text uh, that you provided to the troopers, that was what was on your phone? Yes. So there was no deletions, no excising any material, nothing like that before you gave it to the troopers? No. Exactly what was on my phone, I provided to them. And specifically as you were providing it to them or shortly thereafter, did you have a conversation with Sergeant Buchan uh, Buchanan in reference to that very talk? If you recall. No, I don't recall. Uh, do you recall him asking you anything about as far as if this was the entirety of, of what you had provided? Oh, he. so I think during the actual interview, he specifically asked me uh, these, I, I, I would say in some substance, he said, you know, is this an accurate representation? Has, has anything been deleted? And I, I said, no. I mean, as with respects to the text with the defendant from the, from the, from the first time, that she reached out to me and texted me. Nothing had been deleted. As far as John's text string, we might have had older text strings that were deleted, but that was what I gave him. What I gave the troop is, was exactly when I captured everything is exactly, it is, it was, it is what it is. Everything that was the, on those phones was provided. Nothing was deleted. And as far as um, when you provided these text communications to the troopers, uh, um, was that something that they had asked for, or was that something that you volunteered? I, volunteer, I volunteered that to them. And uh, upon them sort of receiving them from you, did they have further questions uh, beyond what they had already asked you based on what you provided? I believe they, they got into other specific questions specifically in relation to John O'Keefe and the defendant, as far as intimacy and things like that. There was, there was more detailed questions that followed. Your Honor, may I approach the witness? Yes.
to these uh, I'm going to show you uh, two documents. One. one is 12 pages long, one is 56 pages long. You can just look at those briefly uh, and familiarize yourself with them, look up when you finish. What those are, sir? I'm oh, sorry, could you say that? Sure, got my apologies. Do you recognize what those are, sir? Yes. And what do you recognize those? Are? So, those are what, those are the two documents that I provided to the troopers during the interview. And uh, the shorter one, who, if any one, is those communications with? John O'Keefe. And the longer one, about 56 pages long or so, who, if any one, of those communications with? The defendant. May I approach John? Yes. Almost introduced in a minute. Okay. So we'll do them separately, please, so that the first 12-page one. May I return both of those to the Yes. I'm going to direct your attention first to what's been marked as Exhibit 103. And in that, uh, the communications, uh, or the text communications that you had uh, with Mr. O'Keefe. Yes. <coughs> and sir, if I could turn your attention to uh, the first um, sort of content uh, within that, just in reference to uh, what is the, the date of, of the first sort of exchange uh, in these text communications between yourself and, and Mr. O'Keefe? Wednesday, November 24th. And in general, uh, can you describe for the jury what that conversation was about on, on Wednesday, November 24th? He basically, it's it's kind of hard to read, I apologize, but it looks like he, he just reached out to me. Uh, he said, what's up, pal? Uh, where are we going to hang local? We are going to hang local. Are you drinking? So he's out and he's trying to see where you are and if you want to meet up. Yes. Okay. Now, sir, if I could direct uh, your attention to the last page uh, within those uh, documents you have before you. So with reference to uh, there's some conversation on the bottom of that last page uh, from uh, January, Sunday, January 16th. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. Now, you had mentioned uh, that... Uh, with respect to uh, Mr. O'Keefe, um, you had been over his house on a prior occasion to watch the Patriots game, correct? Yes. And when was that in relation to uh, this uh, date that we've been talking about as far as the 28th and the 29th? How long before? So this, it was the 16th? Um, so Might that, have been the 15th into the 16th, I believe. So that text on the 16th was either same day or, or the day following when you had gone over there to watch the Patriots game? Well, with a, yeah, with the text where I asked if I, if I broke his nephew's toy uh, video game was, would have been the next day. Now, in reference to uh, Mr. O'Keefe, you described uh, that he was a friend of yours, is that correct? Yes. Now, where you used to live in Canton, uh, where was that or how close was that in relation to where Mr. O'Keefe lived on Meadows Ave? Not far at all. Um, several blocks. Now, prior to um, you going over there for the Patriots game, um, 
at some point, uh, or had you been over to his home at any previous time? So I reached out, we had inclement weather. It might have been around the, the beginning of January, maybe uh, 6th to 7th. And uh, I shot him a text and said, um, do you want me to clear the driveway for you? So using the same plow that you were talking about before, you had offered to clear out his driveway? Yes. Now, on this occasion that you go over there for the Patriots game, prior to that, um, had the two of you uh, had any conversation or had you been invited to, to go over there with reference to football games before? Um, yes, a number of times at the hillside, you know, I, I was asked, you know, hey, we're going to watch the last half at the house. Do you want to come by? Things like that. Yes. And had you ever taken Mr. O'Keefe up on any of those prior invitations to come by the house and watch it? No. And uh, so on this particular game, do you recall uh, why it was that you uh, took him up on, on it this time and went over? Well, I felt bad I had never been over there. I've been asked repeatedly. Um, I knew it was probably going to be the last game for the season. And I had also independently got a text of an invite from John himself and then also from the defendant on independently. Now, in reference to you thinking it was going to be the last game of the season, do you recall, like, was it, was it a regular season game, playoff game? Who were they playing? Do you recall any of that? I think it might have been the Bills. I don't, I don't know if it was the playoffs or the – it was just another game to me. But I knew it was probably going to be the last game. And so if you recall that evening, about what time was it that you, that you stopped by Mr. O'Keefe's house? Oh, it was like just before the game ended, not, not, not long after. So pretty, fair, pretty far into the second half of the game by the time you arrived? Oh, yeah. And in addition to Mr. O'Keefe, who, if anyone else, was, was at the house when he left? I believe... Chris Curran and his wife might have been there at one point. I think maybe the wife left, but he stayed. I believe maybe Mr. Curran, I was never met him before. I think they introduced him as Mr. Curran's brother. And then um, John's nephew. And uh, I don't know if his niece was there. She might have been in the other room. And uh, the defendant, Ms. Reed, was she there as well? Yes. And as far as the, uh, the Karens are concerned, are, are those people you're familiar with and how do you know them? Uh, again, the hillside. Uh, I met them there um, and I believe through John O'Keefe. How well did you know them at that point? Not very well. Um, now you mentioned that uh, John's nephew was there. Uh, had you ever met him before? No. And um, what if any interaction did you have with his, with his nephew while you were there? Um, we were playing video games together. And uh, so the text, um, if I could direct your attention back to the text communications before you with Mr. O'Keefe on that last page. Um, specifically, there's um, text that exchanged between the two of you on Sunday, uh, January 16th, correct? I see the text. That's about 9.30 in the morning, is that correct? Still early on this last page, which one is it? One, two, or three? Uh, about the middle of the page. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, can you repeat that again? I uh, may I approach the witness. Yes. <clears throat> yeah, I'm just saying it's a little difficult to read. I'm, I apologize. I would direct your attention to right about there where it says Sunday, January 16th. Do you see that, sir? Yes. And that indicates about 9.33 in the morning? Yes, I see it. Okay. And uh, if you could um, read from that text exchange, and if you, uh, if you know, if you could indicate sort of who's talking or who's saying it. Um, it says, TF, hurting like this in 10 years. Ha ha, I, I'm not, I'm not sure, I'm not sure who's saying that. 
Not sure who's hurting and who's saying haha. Well, I know I was definitely hurting that morning, um, but I'm not sure who was saying that. And uh, what, if any other, communication is there later on in the same chain? All right, I, I see, John. Was it necessary to introduce Hennessy XO? Was I really playing video games? That, that would have been me. And then it says, I blame Karen. Yup. And then I said, please tell me I didn't break your nephew's video game. If I did, I'll replace it. Did I throw a controller or some shit? Um, and then uh, it says, I don't think so. WTF, I'm hurting. How can you guys not be still in bed? Is that the end of that and then it, the conversation? It appears to be, yeah. Yes. And then the next uh, conversation begins on uh, what's indicated as uh, Saturday, 12.20 a.m. Is that correct? Yes. And is it your recollection that that was January 29th? Yes. And is that uh, the message that you sent to Mr. O'Keefe while you were in the residence at 34 Fairview Road? Yes. I said, are you coming here with three, followed by three question marks? And again, Mr. O'Keefe, based on your recollection and based on the records you have before you never responded to that text, is that correct? That's correct. And you never saw him after that, correct? Never again, no. Can I approach just to retrieve your arm? Yes. And I may we approach? Yes. Jurors, feel free to stand up and there's more to come in the trial of Chad Daybell. Press subscribe so you don't miss any of our continuing coverage right here from True Crime Today and the Hidden Killers podcast.